I cannot imagine starting my week off in any other way than in a manner that reminds me of how I kicked off my week for about 11 years back in the day when I was in the TV business. And that is with uh, what was the perfect wingman, uh, Batman and Robin, Abbott and Costello. I'm not sure which one is which most days, but there's only one Langer. And uh, I am I'm so stoked about it. Just get a chance to pick her brain in her heart and find out what she's up to. Leanne Lang. Lang. From our TV days. Thank you for joining us, Langer. What is going on? You know what? It was the one thing I knew I was going to, it was going to like bring me right back. As soon as you called me Langer, it's like I'm back to being 22 again. And, you know, and like when Tony wants things done, he'll call me Langer. Just, you know, like something <laughs> to, like the Langer comes out when it needs to come out. Yeah. So I appreciate that from you. Now, for those who don't know, we met over 20 years ago. It'll be 24 now, I think. It was 24 years ago. I was trying to do the math. Probably around, probably around that. It was 19, it was 1998. Was it 98? Okay. Oh, and yeah. I was yeah. over at Corona Gymnastics doing a story on the anniversary of the gym, celebrating that with your mom. And I met you and uh, we had a quick conversation. And I, I kind of knew that we were looking for another sports anchor reporter at CHRO. And you did a demo and... Okay. History. history was made so, from that point on you know that i tell this story like a lot of the time is when i like i'm right. speaking and some people are like how did you end up in in television because i graduated from umass with two business degrees mm -hmm. so i was like broadcasting communication wasn't even like anywhere near what i was going to do my mom of course had this 25th anniversary i had just come home from university uh, oh, i was God. a gymnast so i had the athletic background and you know, and I sent out all the press releases for my mom. So when you came, you were like, who sent the press release, right? That's the first thing we go to is like, who has the who, what, where, when, why? And so we, we, we were talking, but you did. You like handed me Richard Gray's business card after our conversation and yeah. kind of gave me the rundown. And I was on TV five days later. Like yeah. it's like one of those, you know, and it was like university educated, female, elite mm -hmm. athlete, comfortable on camera. And it yeah. was just like, Boom. And then we were stuck together. <laughs> and, and, you're and, like, and, and, and you you had what told me about your athletic background is that you were willing to work hard. Yeah. I right? mean, Despite I think not having any experience and I didn't have a whole lot of experience outside of being interviewed when I was playing football, but the experience of working hard and honing your craft and you were more than willing to do that. And uh, I also knew that city TV who had purchased us anyways, I knew from the style standpoint, cause I had been in Toronto that, uh, you didn't have to be that traditional broadcaster. Hello, sports fans. Mm -hmm. You could be a bit of a personality and a character. And some of the great personalities uh, were female sports broadcasters. And I thought this could be a real good fit for, for, for Leanne. And uh, I, 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 there's no way I imagined 24 years, 25 years later, here we are. I know. But it just worked out that way. I know. It's, I think it's amazing. And just to kind of go back like to the, uh, the athlete in a lot of us, right? It's, yeah. Um, it's not so much also that we're hardworking and determined and competitive, uh, but I think the key, the key word is coachable. I yeah. think you want people that are coachable and that will take direction and will see it as positive criticism or yeah. this is how you can be better. It's like our coaches weren't yelling at us because they thought we were shit. Oh. Are we allowed to swear? Sorry, I'm used to like my podcasting oh, thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> You know, um, and it, it's like, we're always looking to become better. And I think when you yeah. put like two people like us, like you threw me in, it's like, I had to, I had to learn. Like, and so it's like, yeah. all right, coach, put me in and let me learn. I, we learned live on the air. I mean, it wasn't like, like we were learning as we were live, you know, doing the newscast. And I had to learn that way. It's like, you threw me in with the, the sharks and I had to really figure out how to swim quickly. And I think also, especially from the two of us in our backgrounds is we understood what it was to be an athlete. So when we were talking to other athletes or we were talking to, you know, or was someone was injured, it wasn't like, well, why aren't you back out on the field? Like you understood the pain, the suffering, the rehab, the kind of psychological thing of coming back from in, an injury. So I think we just had a really good feel of what we felt the story would be coming from our perspective also. So I, I, I loved it. I mean, it was, it, and we, I was 10 years as your side uh, doing sports, yeah. And, and, and talk about two degrees of separation. Uh, when I meet you, and 
you throw yourself into it. And it wasn't just stand there and become an uh, on-camera personality, but you had to edit, you had to shoot all your stuff, right? And what a great team to be a part of to do that. It was, again, serendipitous luck that we were with all these people who are in the same boat, going the same direction. And, and we had everything to gain and nothing to lose. Right. Uh, but then two degrees of separation is that uh, I knew Tony before he knew you. My husband, yeah. Because Tony, my yeah. husband, was an all-Canadian quarterback, and I was an all-Canadian receiver, and we had met because Tony's about 20 years older than you, like me. Stop, stop it! <laughs> hey! Hey! Older. hey. <laughs> I mean, there's there's 11 years between us, yeah. uh, and trust me, like I met him, and I like it was like like it was immediate, and then yeah. and he didn't look like he was 11 years older than me no. 20 years ago. No. Yeah. Um, and then when I found out how old he was, I was like, oh, seriously, but yeah. I, it was, it was like immediate. So I, I was, I was in. Yeah. But I knew, stories, I knew stories about you from Tony that ended up coming back to me too. So it, and, that's yeah, all, you know. and that's all top secret information that we can't yeah. repeat here because it's probably still in the courts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's get back to the Tony. idea. That yeah. There you are an athlete and you walk into a locker room, instead of send locker room. And the number one, I didn't have to necessarily do it because I was a guy walking in that room. But from a credibility standpoint, uh, you had to you had to sort of earn your points with the guys in that room. And how did your athleticism and trusting that you've already been down that path, mm -hmm. how did that help you create that credibility with the, with the room? Well, I, I had to listen. I knew what it was like to be an athlete and I knew what it was like to compete in high pressure situations. But the one thing I didn't know, and I loved sports, like growing up, I loved watching sports. Um, and I think what helped too is like being at a, an American university. So I was at UMass, all of my friends were varsity athletes. Yeah. So, um, all of my friends were hockey, baseball, basketball, um, football, like they were all athletes. And so we had almost like our own fraternity, like my housemates, were hockey players like I was living yeah. with friends they were my best friends who were getting drafted into the NHL so I didn't have these were my friends and I wasn't intimidated by them I think that was a critical thing yeah. is that I felt that I was at that I was on a level with them and I wasn't coming at it from a oh my god you're a hockey player or oh my god you're playing yeah. in the NHL like I was comfortable being in that room as a fellow athlete asking questions. What I had to do is I had to really learn the intricacies of the game. When people were talking about, uh, you know, the, you know, who was third line, who was first line, who was on the power play, who like, I had to learn the, the details of, of asking the right questions that had to do with that player or with the game coming up or what was going on. So for me, it was understanding my material more so than understanding how to connect with the players. And back then, like this is 20 some years ago, like yeah. now I look at female reporters, like they're all, they're dating, they're getting married. Like, yeah. like now it's much more freer, but 20 years ago, it was like business. Like I had to make sure I didn't like, I was like all, all in, all focused because I knew people were more looking at me to say, oh, she's flirting or she's trying to get, this attention or something. Yeah. And so I was like extra vigilant on making sure that it was very professional and, you know, and that I found was the hardest thing and not so much from the players, but from the other media. Like I, I, I was being watched yeah. by everybody else, not so much the players, because the players knew I could shoot the shit with them and talk about yeah. stuff. And, and I was pretty smart too, is I got to know their wives and their girlfriends. And yeah. I went in that way too, right? Like I was, we were all the same age also at that time, you know, like I was 22 years old when I started the job. Like they, we were all kind of, we all kind of grew up together. Like Wade Redding, Chris Phillips, Daniel Alfredson, like we all laugh now, like 20 oh, yeah. some years later, we grew up in the city kind of that way together. So, um, you know, I, I, I went about it a little differently, but very aware that I was being watched. And so I was very careful about that. It helped when I got engaged to Tony, then people kind of, backed off a little bit you know i'm not sure if you can hear my kids right now i can't know this is what you call a coaching moment a coaching opportunity okay elijah summer nate can you go into your room and shut the door though because we can hear you i'm sure they are tackling you but tackle yourselves in the room with the door shut behind you thanks guys 
Uh, so back to the point, and, and it was really important, I knew that you didn't just do fluff pieces. No. Right? right? Where, does, where does Chris Phillips like to have his pregame meal, right? You had to get in there and get the numbers and the stats, and, you and there was no margin for error. I could screw up and be, oh, Ken messed up. But if you messed up, all the hockey purists, the reporters, and the fans be like, what is she doing? What is well, she doing? I had to earn it. I had to earn it, but I think yeah. I, I think I did. But that's being an yeah. athlete. You, you figure out how to get it right. Practice makes perfect, right? Yeah. And and we had to do a story every day. Yeah, people so, don't realize that. Like you and yeah. I, every day, we're coming in, going, okay, who's who's doing what? Who's covering what? Right? Yeah. And it, I mean, we're talking, you know, stems right now. But at the time, we also had. Uh, for it was like off and on, but football. We had the Ottawa yeah. Lynx. We had uh, the lacrosse team. What was the lacrosse team? Oh, I forget now. The Rebel. Remember? So there was uh, professional uh, lacrosse. We had yeah, like and, back and then. We, we had, had like high the school Wizards. Sports. University and high school sports we were very connected to. Basketball was huge too. Yeah. Carlton and uh, you know they were building up their programs at that time. Football had just been dropped at Carlton. That's when the start. So football got dropped at Carlton. That's when yeah. they made the investment into the basketball program. And that's yeah. when we saw the basketball program just explode. So we saw all of that. And we saw like the um, Ottawa U University, their women's soccer team. A lot of those girls ended up playing for the national team, ended up being part of that program that built up our women's soccer program. Like there's so many stories. Like I remember covering Jesse Levine. He was 11 years old. Jesse Levine Jesse? went on to compete uh, on the world tennis tour. He was Roger yeah. Federer's training partner. Like we saw these kids you know, as kids, Gabriella Dabrowski, yeah. she was Wimbledon doubles. Like I remember covering her when she was 10, you know, like mm -hmm. there's just, there's so many amazing stories, but it was more than just the pros. Like there was amateur sport was with a big part of it. So we draw from our coaching experiences from other coaches. Uh, we've developed a work ethic and now we have to work hard, but we also have to work smart. And I think that was the key for us to be successful was not just run around with our, like a chicken with its head cut off, but to be able to work smart and tell stories that were nuanced that would leave. We wanted people to talk about the story. So when we saw them on the street, they didn't say, Hey, there's Langer. And they people called you Langer cause that was your nickname. But they also said, they also talked to you about the stories you did, which was important mm -hmm. because if you're not doing your job, they don't remember your, your work. Right. But, the, but that was, the, I think that's what you and I were great as we were passionate about telling stories. And I think for me, I love the amateur stories too, because they're, yeah. and I, I feel like we're missing that now. Like news television has changed drastically. We don't have that content anymore. And I feel like we're like, there's a generation of future athletes that's missing out on uh, having yeah. their stories told or feeling like motivated. Oh, if I do this, you know, maybe they'll, Somebody will know my story. Like we're missing out on so many awesome amateur sports now, just because it's been local newscasts. It's just, it's changed, and and it's too bad. I I'm, I feel bad for the generation coming up that they don't have that exposure that other generations had. I do as well, and I I feel badly because uh, no one's telling the, their their story, and that was always a really important thing. And I had a great driver for young athletes. They wanted to be on the local TV. They wanted to be mm. in the newspaper. And it, it would it would tell them that they were going in the right direction. And right. It, it would spur them on, give them some confidence. And uh, and in, and because athletes are driven by ego, it also kind of filled our cup. Right. But it's not such yeah. a bad thing. Like I, I often felt like they worked hard. They deserve some recognition. And it was yes. not so much about ego. It's recogni it's recognizing their efforts so that they realize that it's keep going. Keep going. Like people, yeah. people are rooting for you. They they like your story. They love what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's too bad. It was always funny when we'd reach out to somebody and we want to do a story on you. And the first question would be, well, why? And we almost had to convince them they were great, which was always a lot of fun. And yeah, we needed to have a six o'clock story that day. <laughs> and we need a six o'clock story. Yeah. We so need there, a story. Like, can we be honest? Like there were some days where it was like two, three o'clock and it was like, you had to have something on at six. Like there were, there were a couple of you and I going like, what are we going to do? Yeah. Do you remember the bungee jumping story? The one at, uh, at the great Canadian. At Wakefield? Yeah. And so I bungee jumped. You did the, uh, what was that? The, the drop that line, right? You did the you did the rip line or the zip line. 
Oh yeah, I no, I made a commitment to my mom I would never bungee jump, so I never did it. Yeah, and I did the bungee jump, and they gave me about twenty three countdowns before I finally did it. Uh, after a while, I was like, he's not going to jump. But so many fun stories, and again, people were like, you want to do a story on us, and they didn't realize that they were doing us a bigger favor than we were doing them because we had to get content on the air. The last thing we wanted to do is go back to Kim Way without a story. No, you didn't do that. No. Right. We had like those early years, Cam. We was like us driving around in that van. Like and we would stop at parks. We would like, we were building it. No one, like it was the start. It was the new station. It was like having to build up. And so we could call coaches and call teams and they would know, you know, yeah. who we were, what we were doing. By the end, it was great. We had it was good for the yeah, it was great, yeah. So, so you segue then, uh, things change, the market changes, the, the entire environment changes and a bunch of people are like, oh, I'm part of that group. But you transitioned to becoming a morning show host. Uh, how did you navigate that water? I was really angry at first. Yeah. Um, well, I was angry when I, cause I was switched off of, af so after my second child, after having Jamie, I was switched to the morning show. Um, yeah. And uh, my first response was, um, I've never seen the morning show. Yeah. Cause I'm not a morning person. Sports people, like it's late at night, right? We're doing highlights, okay. it's night. Yeah, so I was like, I've never seen the morning show. Uh, I'm not a morning person, I'm a vampire. This is going to kill me. Uh, and you know, Richard was very much like, I, I need you to have the attitude that you had 10 years ago when you first came in and was, and was open to learning and being coachable and all the other things that I had to rely on 10 years earlier. And so um, for me, the biggest challenge was the 3.30, 3.45 wake up call. For me, that was the biggest adjustment. It wasn't being on camera. It wasn't hosting a four hour show. I loved all of that. It was the the hours. They were what Tony called the life ruiner. I mean, it was, we had, I was six, I went back with each girl uh, after six months of mat leave, you know? So here I am, uh, two young kids and I'm getting up at 3.30 in the morning to go wake up a city. Yeah. 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 So, that had to be tough, uh, but you managed it. You did it for yeah. how many years? Ten? Ten years? I did it for ten. Yeah, and I and I and I loved it. Um, yeah. And there were some amazing years. There were some years where it was a, a ton of fun. It was a great crew. The show was completely unscripted. It was four hours of fun, uh, making fools of ourselves, kind of, yeah. you know, banter back and forth. Uh, and so there was like a good couple of years where I didn't notice it. Like I, I got into the routine, um, you know, it was the 3.30 wake up call, the working until one, the meetings, the promos, the workout, the yeah. picking up the kids from school at three, going and I go to go until 10. Um, and then towards the last couple, it just stopped being as fun. The yeah. show changed, uh, the scripting changes, the, the ho like it just got to a point where it was like, it's not worth the 3.30 wake up call anymore, yeah. if that makes any sense. But you stayed for a couple more years and it sort of reminds me of, I probably should have left football two years earlier. But when you leave, you don't know what's on the other side of the curtain. So you dance with the devil you know and you stay, even though it's probably like a butter knife to the, your throat, it's eventually going to get your jugular over time because you've manufactured this, this what's on the other side. Oh my mm -hmm. God. I, I don't know. And we, cause we saw other people have a difficult time transitioning from TV and radio into the real world. Uh, was it like that for you? So you had to bite the bullet for a couple of years. Um, no, I think like, to be honest with you, I think I was going and there was enough like the, the people changed, the, the show changed and I kind of could adapt and I kept adapting and adapting. Mm -hmm. uh, until one day I was sitting there kind of looking around going, I think I, there's no more to adapt. I like, it's yeah. just, it wasn't there. And yeah. then I started. So for me in the process of me deciding, and, and I think a lot of people know, like it was the shingles for me uh, yeah. in June of 2017. That really, that was my trigger. My body fully reacted. I was exhausted. Um, and it was my mind, hey guys, see now it's my turn. And I, I realized that my body was reacting to being exhausted and yeah. I had checked out, I had checked out mentally. And so that was the start of me saying, I'm checked out. I'm on Groundhog Day. This is time to go. And yeah. so that's when I started, it was actually more the ego that I had to work on first of understanding that I was moving away from 
being the girl on TV, yeah. um, you know, being in the know, being at all the top events. I had to start slowly taking my ego out of kind of the way it was going. And then I was more prepared for what was going to be next. And I felt I had 20 years of being, I had 20 years of growing up on television, essentially, that I had a good enough branding and that people knew where my passions were. And I was authentic storyteller that it was the right time to be able to go. Yeah. So you're an authentic storyteller. And I love that because now you have to find a new authenticity in the next chapter. And it's tough to do because you walk down the street and it's not like people forget you. It's not like you're now undercover. You go to the store, hey, there's Leanne Lang, hey, there's Langer, there's all that. And it's tough to make that transition because essentially what you are is unemployed, right? And trying to trying to reemploy yourself and find your niche. Because I see, I like, didn't look at it that way. Like, and I think I didn't, I really didn't look at it that yeah. way. Um, like at all. So maybe, maybe this is a different shift for other people who are looking to make a leap of faith. I took a massive leap of faith based on knowing that I had, um, I was hardworking, I was creative, and I was going to follow my passion and what I liked more. So no, I left television November 11th, November 10th. Um, right. I had already been working on my, I know, I, I didn't feel I was unemployed. I went from being an employee of 20 years to my yeah. president of my company. Um, I never, you know, looked, I never once thought of myself as unemployed. It was, I have become a president of a company that I need to build. And yeah. that was my, and that was my attitude. And I started building, I got websites built. Um, and I knew for me that the podcast was going to be my biggest, that that's what I was doing. And it was taking yeah. all of the guests that I'd had on the morning show for 10 years and even in sports and having four minutes, we have four minutes to do an interview on the morning show. Yeah. And oftentimes, especially when it was like health and wellness related, like Panger, my yeah. Panger, our director, would be yelling at me in my earpiece going, you got to throw it a commercial break already. But I was so interested in these topics and there was so much more information that I was just like, oh, we're not getting to the good stuff. And that's yeah. why I was sitting on set in television going, there's so much more to these stories and there's so much more that we could be giving people. And that was my direction. Leaving television was like, I want to take these stories make them into a podcast and be able to have an impact on people's lives. I wanted to inspire people to live healthier, happier, more fulfilled lives. So I have to say there was never a day in my head that I felt like I was unemployed. I was not making the money that I had made, but there was no thought process that I was unemployed. I was, I was working. I just wasn't making the money that I was used to making or any money at all for that matter for a while. And it reconnects with your core, the athlete. Give me an opportunity and let me work hard. Right. That's all I need. That's I don't all need I to be given the, the I don't need to be the captain of the team. I don't need to be given, right? I want to earn it. And I'm not afraid to go about and earn it, especially if you're passionate about what you do. And I've had this conversation with a bunch of people now, uh, Joanne Pollock and Vern White and Ray Zay have, and and I and and, and they all agree, and I, I, I'm sure you will. Is that when you wake up in the morning, and literally and figuratively for you, uh, you wake up in the morning, you start your day, and you ask yourself the question, consciously or subconsciously, am I in my right time or my right place? And if, you, if you're not, and you go about your day, you're a warrior, but you're fighting a battle that isn't personal, there's, right? you're not invested in it, until then you wake up and say, okay, I'm, I'm in my right time, my right place, I'm on an authentic journey, I'm not where I want to be right now, but I know I'm on my way. And that's what gets, gets you going. That's what kicks you in the butt and gets you, put some pep in your step. Absolutely. And yeah. like, and I, I had Ray Zahab on my podcast. I love yeah. the energy off of that man is just amazing. I really love, yeah. I, I love Ray. Um, and I think because the way my guests have gone over the last two and a bit years, where I started with my guests is very different from where my guests are now, just because I've, there's been so much personal growth and how, what I've had to do to be able to find where I enjoy being with myself. And it's not the TV version of me because as much as I was prepared to let go of that, I, I didn't quite let go of all of it. And it was holding me back from making the next step. And I think that was a big thing that I had to learn going through experience is that I needed to fully let go of yeah. who I was to be able to be the person. And I, I was like um, the oh, caterpillar. Wow. Like I stayed in that chrysalis stage a yeah. lot longer than I thought I was going to. 
I knew I had to change and transform right. to come out the butterfly. But the chrysalis stage was a lot longer for me than I had mentally prepared for. That I wasn't coming out of that stage yet because I didn't know what I was emerging as. And that, and that right. became part of the guests that I started to book in, which were on gratitude and mindfulness and, yeah. you know, living in the present moment and kindness and all of these things that I hadn't really considered became part of the, the growth process, like in it, you know? So, so let me, let me look at it this way then. There you are doing the morning show and you got a four minute segment for a great interview, but yeah. you know, you could, you want 20 minutes with this person. Yeah. But to go from four minutes to 20 minutes means you have to offer yourself. You have to give that situation an authenticity because you can't be asking the same sort of standard I, questions. If you want them to go somewhere deep and personal, you have to be there with them. I love that. I like that's where that's what I've been meant. That's what I was meant to do. Yeah. These long form and 20 minutes is like that's nothing. My podcasts are an hour and I, I keep it at an hour because yeah. I know because I'm putting myself into the listener's spot. And it's like, they're either, well, back before COVID hit, but like, I thought of it as their commute. It was their commute to work or back, or it was their, they put the podcast on to go walk the dog for their long dog walk. So I kept it knowing that people would know it's an hour long, either drive there, drive back or something or a, a walk. Um, and so there have been times when it's been an hour and I'm like, I need another, like, I want more time. You know, yeah. like I had four minutes asking for more time. Now I have an hour and I'm asking for more time. But yeah. the the questioner, the storyteller is where I I I finally landed. Like I, I love it. I the hour goes by and I never ask the same question and I never and I never have a prepped question. I yeah. never have gone into a podcast with my hundred and twenty seven guests with a prepped question. It's just you gotta listen. You just you just listen and go, where do we go from here? Yeah. That intuition doesn't come over me. No, that's 20 years of doing interviews on live television. Yeah, because when people people ask me, well, what interview stands out when you're doing sports? And, I, and, and it usually doesn't have to do with the winning goal. It usually doesn't have to deal with, you know, the championship that was won. It's a nuanced story. And I remember the one for me was Tom Barrasso. You remember Tom? Yeah. And he was a real son of a gun. And nobody liked him. I don't think he even liked Very himself. Nice. The part. And I'm not sure if you remember, but he broke his finger in practice. So he was out for, and we, the media treated like it was a presidential assassination attempt. It was only a broken finger. But he finally practiced the, in, at, with that broken finger and came in and they stood him on that little soapbox that they bring out for the big interviews. You remember? And all the media there. And Tom, how's your finger? Went, Fine. Right? Uh, how did it feel to be back in the ice? fine and it was going nowhere and i said i remember i think i had to go about differently so i said tom is the only place you feel a sense of calm and quietness was in the crease with these guys fighting shooting pucks at you 100 miles an hour after you know his daughter your daughter had been diagnosed with cancer and she was battling that and his, his dad had passed away and he he kind of turned and just thought it was subtle but he turned his body and you know these scrums right they just look straight ahead right he kind of turned his body and looked at me and we had a conversation now, everybody used the clip, but it was one of those intuitive, trust my instinct, ask this question. You could have said, is it any of your business? But he took it a completely different way. And that's what kind of stands out for me when we had those moments when we were working together. No, I, but that's it, right? You're like, where, where is this going to go? Or what do people, you kind of sometimes think like, what do people at home want to know? Like everyone's going to like, you know, like, yeah, we get the same standard questions, but what's going to, what's going to entice someone to listen longer or wait for the follow-up question? Like, oh, that was really interesting. Like, what else are they going to say? So, yeah. yeah. And, and, and because we weren't allowed to do voiceovers, right? So right. we had to use our question, which was great because the viewer knew that everybody on TSN and Roger Sportsnet was using our content, but not our question, but we were asking the question, right? And I always found that interesting. I always I remember too having a conversation with Alfie and Chris Neal and Spezza. They were sitting there after all the scrums were done. And I looked around and it wasn't against anything in the media, but I said, it's kind of ironic that you guys are being asked questions, being criticized by a lot of guys who barely passed gym class. 
<laughs> we won't we won't we won't name names <laughs> no no but right and and you know i always thought alfie and those guys doing it groundhog day and day in and day out the same thing over and over again but uh let's get to leanne lang who she is today let's talk about the podcast let's talk about everything you're doing now i love the podcast i'm on 127 episodes i think 28 comes out this week wow. um it and it's funny because it took me until episode 100 to do my first solo uh, okay. which was really just me and the stories and how I kind of ended up where I was. Right. Uh, and it's amazing what resonates with people, right? Like you think you were booking in the best guests and the best information and such great right. things, you know, like head of hospitals and heart institutes and all this other crazy stuff. Uh, right. And sometimes what they just really want to listen to is, is you. Like I have to, I, I, it's funny because I've been looking to speak and, and, and speaking on stages and as keynote and hosting events. Uh, and I was talking to a girlfriend and I was like, I just, I'd love to speak more. And she's like, you want to speak more, but you haven't, you ha you're not speaking of yourself. She's like, yeah, you have all these great guests and you have all this stuff, but what are people yeah. listening to when you speak? You know, you, people need to know what you're speaking about. And so she was really the one that encouraged me um, to, to get on and to do a solo and to actually talk. And it was, it took me to a hundred episodes. And uh, my podcasts go live every Thursday morning, and it took me until the last possible day on Tuesday to hit record, and I couldn't even do it. I had to go somewhere else to a studio, and I'm like, you have to hit the record button, or else I'm going to procrastinate again. And yeah. and it was really good to have some, like, it was forced on me, and it was probably a great gift for myself. People really resonated with it, and it was kind of a shift in, in knowing what the podcast is like. Oftentimes, too, with podcasts, you want the relationship with the listeners, right? It's you yeah. and your guest. And so to be able to balance that out um, also is great. I have done, like, I love my guests. Uh, for the first year, there was like a good waiting list to get on. Um, as people mm -hmm. knew, I'd left television to go and do the podcast. Right. And um, like, I was booking months, months in advance. People are like, oh, can I come on next week? And I'm like, I'm booking right now. It's like February. I'm booking for Janet for like, like September. Yeah. You know? So, um, and I have uh, podcast agents from all across the United States that are contacting me now looking to get their doctors and authors and stuff on. Mm -hmm. And people are very, very much in the know, like it's well, health, wellness, inspiring stories. You know, like it's yeah. not, it's not business or it's, it's, it's what are you going to take from it to better your life? So that's been the main thing. If I can answer that question that the viewer will, will the listener, sorry, yeah. can walk away having taken something from it, then that's a good guess. And all roads, regardless of we do, all roads eventually lead to how we treat ourselves and how we exist health wise, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Right. And yeah. uh, I don't think you maybe realize that right away until you've been through a couple of fires, a couple of storms, and you either find yourself going through the same fire over and over again, where you've developed this habit and you've got it now, you've, you've honed it down to an art, or, uh, and you, and you realize, I may have to change things. Yeah. And to change things, you have to let go of something. There's a great book called Transitions. Okay. And it's about if you're going to go someplace, something may have to die. You may have to kill something off from a habit standpoint for what you're doing. Yeah. Because if not, and I've said this a million times, it's like trying to fly with a piano on your back. You're not going to get off the ground. It took me, um, it took me a year, yeah. a year plus to realize that I was in that predicament. Um, yeah. And uh, it was... It was meditation. It was the start of meditating that became, that was my, uh, the trigger of mm -hmm. getting out of my head. And so, you know, once you start reading and once you start exposing yourself to different things, like you're absolutely right. My guests were a certain way for like a good year, like great guests, lots of adventure, inspiring stories. But it wasn't until I started looking inward um, yeah. and how we are, live in our heads, 95% of it's past five, you know, we live in the past. We live in negative self-talk. We live in limiting beliefs. And I, I started to be aware. It took me becoming aware of listening to my thoughts and how negative and how repetitive it was for me to start to make that change. And once I started to do that and started with the meditation and started with a bit more of the gratitude that did I start to see that I was changing with it and liked who I was coming out like on the other end a lot better but i got it for a year like it 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 had to happen it happened just by me finally realizing things had to shift yeah and allowed you to go to from that four minute segment to the one hour segment 
right? Uh, in my own personal head. Yeah. 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 Um, it's funny. There's a, there's a Navy SEAL. His name's Mark Devine. I've been studying him a lot because he runs a thing called uh, SEAL Fit. Okay. Really cool thing. An alpha male type of thing. So I got into it and but I start studying and, I, and he, he really discusses ethos. And again, what what do you stand for? Because if you don't stand for anything, you're going to fall for everything, right? And what are the lines of demarcation and boundaries? And what are you willing to do? And, and it, it sort of simplifies things for you. So it allows you to focus on the task at hand. And he brought up the thing called, uh, it's a readiness chart, colors, readiness colors. And it goes white, yellow, orange, red. White is 95% of the population where life's beating them up and they think that's just their fate. And then they go to yellow where, okay, life's beating me up. I'm a little tired of getting beat up. Time to do something about it, but I don't know quite what I'm going to do about it. So you start venturing and, and spend more time wandering than anything else until you figure some things out. Then you get to orange where, okay, I'm figuring things out. Things are making sense and uh, I'm in a really good place. And then you just get to red where now, red, your, re your alertness, your readiness, and you've been there with, with competitive sport. Like I'll think, well, how the heck would Leanne with thousands of people in the stands want to climb up on a balance beam and do a couple of flips and do this stuff without thinking I'm, I might kill myself. But you're in that state, that red state where it's actually, it's calm because you're driven by your ethos and you're seeing the entire landscape. And most people uh, struggle to get from those colors and get to that place where you see the landscape for what it is, not for what you perceive it to be, not what others see you as in that theater, but how you see it genuinely, honestly, and authentically. And you get there and it, it's amazing how uh, the light comes on. I know. Right? And when you have a light come on, even from one color to the next, yeah, it's pretty cool. Like even if you're in white and you're moving to yellow, yeah. that in itself is like a, like it's pretty interesting. Like it's really, really interesting. And I think what, what I've learned in all of this is I stopped looking at the end result, and yeah. I, I stopped looking at when I'm back to making six figures again and back yeah. to being in this place. I stopped that and through this started to realize, well, I'm going to move from white to yellow. I'll use your thing, right? From white to yellow yeah. to orange to red. And I'm going to enjoy the process of what this is going to feel like moving through those things. And so once you put yourself into let's, life is about this process. I was so focused on because I was so driven to end result. I was yeah. so focused on how I'm going to get to that back to being that elite competitor that I stopped, I stopped enjoying the learning curve. And once I started to be in that present moment of enjoying what it felt like to go from white to yellow and from yellow to orange, I haven't found red yet, but I'm enjoying that. I'm enjoying that, that process of, of seeing the, the growth. And seeing this yeah. switch and how people perceive you or like so it's 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 actually enjoying the pro the journey and that's yeah. life like that's become life and and when people start to realize that or else we, we you miss out you miss out yeah. on don't, don't look at the scoreboard yeah you know you, you can ask any athlete and you've been there uh the final result of a competition is important in the moment but when you look back on it uh you remember you had some victories and some losses and all that, but the people that I, you know, when I played football, the people along the way, what stands out, the relationships, the authenticity. I was so fortunate. And you've been there where you're a Canadian girl from Ottawa going to, you're going to UMass and they're on the same campus and Marcus Camby and, and, and some great athletes, different environment. And you're seeing Southern Americans, Northern, Northeast Americans. You're seeing Americans from the West coast. You're seeing this, this veritable pool of inter interesting people that you can't help but grow from. And it has nothing to do with whether you got a 9.9 .9 on the balance beam, right? No. It's about the people. Yeah, no, it, it, it really is. And I think, I, I think I, I'd like to think that I was open enough back then to, to soak it in, but I definitely yeah. know there was some years where I didn't soak in things as much, right? Like yeah. years, years, 16, 17, 18, maybe on the show. And you know, like there's, you know, there's definitely different things, but I'm so grateful that I now can enjoy looking ahead that for the rest of my years, yeah. I have this way of being appreciative of being in that present moment and enjoying the relationships and what you can take from people, what you can give. I think mm -hmm. that was the big thing too, is, is the, t the giving and the taking.
right? The yeah. more you give, like um, I'm right now doing these Facebook live workouts every morning at 9 a.m. Yeah. Friday, you know, and there are so many trainers out there and doing things, but I've interviewed thousands of trainers and, you know, I had the today's the day segment, which was my health and wellness segment on the show. Mm -hmm. I interview them on my podcast. Like I have so much information and ideas from them. And I'm going to work out anyway, and I needed yeah. accountability. So I was like, I'll open up my workouts and I'll do them live and people can do them. And I've now got a great community of people at 9 a.m. Monday to Friday. And then a lot of people that watch them afterwards. But I feel so good yeah. like, giving. Yeah. Like, it's, it's my way of giving back. It's like people are struggling. People are struggling to move and they're struggling to get off the couch and yeah. There's, and I'm like, oh my God, like everyone's like, thank you so much for doing this. And this is great. And I'm like, I actually feel good doing this. Like that is, yeah. that is joy. And if people can find that in their day, like to have a joy in doing something, yeah. you're yeah. the battle. I finish at 10 and I'm like, my workout's done. I've helped people. Let's go on with the day, you know? And I don't know if I would have done that two years ago. Yeah. Because I, th I think the expectation is, well, Leanne's doing this. And she better be perfect, right? No, gosh, I'm not at all. Like I'm all that stuff and versus you. And 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 is is it Jamie that keeps joining you? Yeah, Jamie does them with me. Yeah, and she's you get hilarious. Time as well. Yeah. yeah. And and I look at the comments, and a lot of people are saying, "I love the workout," and I love Jamie being a part of it. Yeah. Right. She, and she's pretty good, but she has soccer. She has her visual, like her virtual soccer practice tonight. So she's like, yeah. "I'm not doubling up." Uh, you know, but, and, but the thing is too, is I'm getting a lot of messages from parents now whose kids are doing it. Yeah. Like, and is there quality time with their 12 or 13 year old to do it? So like, it just, it, it just, it feels yeah. good. And I'm, I wouldn't have done this three years ago, but yeah. I'm ready to, I'm, I'm of a different space that I, I enjoy being able to do it now. And I think growth, no matter what stage you're at, or if you have yeah. your people that you're working with can, who are starting new businesses or taking on a different leadership role or anything, it's like, once you realize what you're able to give of yourself, you're better off as a leader, yeah. as, you know, as, as a person that you want to work with, you know, that's a huge part of it. And I didn't know that before. We were coming from a pretty toxic environment where we were. If I'm yeah. allowed to say that, right? Yeah, it was, it was challenging. There were some challenges, that's for sure. But yeah. at the same time, it made us stronger and allowed us to compete. And I love that. We were the sort of the David versus Goliath. And we loved it. What I loved was one competing with CTV, but more importantly, we had more fun. Right? Yeah. We had more fun at, at 11.30 when we'd all go out for drinks and something to eat over at Local Heroes. And, and oh gosh, I remember and, that, yeah. And listen, I talked about that and, and we'd all go there for a beer, and beer and a half and play some games and have some bad food and then go on our way and do it and then, okay. Especially, especially on paydays, those were fun. So, um, I don't want to keep you much more, but I want to make sure we get uh, to leannelang.com. Yeah, but it's it's living your life, living, living your life. life with Leanne Lang, the podcast. That's like, okay. that's my baby. That's my baby. Okay. That's what uh, that's what I I love when people say I they've been listening to the podcast. And that is every <laughs> Thursday. So there's a release every Thursday. Um, and uh, sometimes I have bonus podcasts that come on just like on the Monday when I have too many people in line. And so I released a bonus one. Um, and, and sometimes they're actually quite timely. Like I had a bonus one that was um, Eliza Kingsford. She's a, a brain weight loss. So everything like weight loss isn't most of the time yeah. coming from anything other than the relationship that your gut and your brain you know, so she, she was like, did one on eating through quarantine. Right. So I've thrown other things in, um, also on Mondays, so, but it used every Thursday. I haven't, I haven't missed a day in tune since I left television. I'm very proud of that. No matter what, there's been a release every Thursday. That's yeah. outstanding. It's, it's competitive person in me, right? It's accountability. And, and, and we need that schedule. The athletes need that schedule. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I think so. It's like, you know, and a lot of the times when I'm talking to, to groups and stuff, I talk about the planning of it. Like, you know, yeah. when I left, I left in the morning, I got up at 345. I showered, I got into the car and yeah. was downtown by 430 with my hair soaking wet back in my pajamas. You know, it was like Aero TV. We taped that at five. The show was at six, six to 10. 
but I had with me, I had my food packed, my snacks packed. I had my gym bags packed, like at the door waiting for me to start my day with everything that I was going to need to have find success. I had good snacks. I had healthy snacks. I had my gym stuff so that I knew I couldn't come home until I had gone to the gym. You know, like you've got to plan ahead so yeah. that you have, it's not going to just magically happen that you magically eat well, or you magically found yourself at the gym. Yeah. You, you had to actually intend on it and plan on it. And so, or tell somebody about it. I'd be like, no, no, I got to get to the gym before I go home. Well, yeah. I said it out loud, right? It's a little yeah. different right now as we're battling, you know, COVID, but eventually life will return and, you know, we'll have to get back into those patterns and hopefully people will emerge mm -hmm. kind of wanting to attack things differently. My three kids, uh, Huey, Dewey, yeah. and Louie, are uh, wondering when they can come up the stairs to play and hang out. Yeah. So it's are it's, they waiting for lunch? Do you have to feed them? They're gonna have some lunch. Yeah, they yeah. they they had some breakfast, but they definitely want some lunch and and snacking and and all the stuff that they want to do because there's no recess, right? So I have to somehow figure out how to burn some energy. So uh, that, what are uh, you doing with them? Um, we're doing some Tabata workouts on yeah. YouTube. There's some really cool Avenger workouts. Uh, I'll set up outside, and we have some stuff they can do some plyo work and all that kind of stuff, and. Uh, I had a friend give us a foosball table. So that's in the middle of the living room. Nice. Yeah. It feels, it feels like I'm back in college with a foosball table in the middle of the room. But, are, there uh, red no, cups, are there red cups anywhere? No red cups are yet. There. Yeah. And no earth ball. Earth balls have been banned ever okay. since they brought that one in the studio when you interviewed those kids. Do you remember that? Yeah. The I, giant uh, yeah, ball, yeah. And you bounced it and it went into the studio lights. Yep. I've had a couple of those doozies. The other one was um, when I was trying the this electric, um, like a golf cart that you could yeah. ride on like a scooter. And yeah. I tried it and I went straight into a car. Like, yeah, <laughs> by live live on television, I crashed it pretty bad. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of like, yeah. I miss the bloopers. The I bloopers do miss the bloopers, crazy. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> proud of you. I'm not surprised you're enjoying this type of success, Langer, because um, you were destined and and, I, yeah, used to, I, I used to try to take a lot of credit for where you ended up, but I think it was inevitable. I just I happened to be the guy credit. who showed up. I do give you credit that you launched me onto this. I was 22. Yeah. I was about to move to Toronto. To, to, to I had just taken a job. Like yeah. people are like, "What was the start for you?" And I'm like, "It it's always will stem from Canterbury. You are the starting point of my conversation. Yeah. Uh, whenever I kind of get into it. it's very it's always a special relationship, you know. It is. It was, it was very very special. Well, for me to be talking to a woman that came into my life 20 years ago and she not be suing me, this is amazing. Right? Like, I am, I am it. You like, are the I one, am, like, has Ken had the... a, a relationship with a woman who yeah. stayed, you know, like it was a, yes, I, I am it. That's it. I am it. Yeah, it can be done. It can be done. It can be done. You are proof. <laughs> so Leah, I, nothing but love for you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. And uh, we'll stay connected, obviously. And uh, uh, see, I got Damon Allen this week, and I got maybe Brad Shaw on Friday. Right. Possibly. Very fun. I'll say hi. So, oh. So you, Damon you Allen, raise, huh? the, raise the bar. Well, yeah, Damon will be fun. Yeah. He'll be fun. He yeah. looked like he was. He looked like he was thirty for like ever, forever and ever and ever and ever. And then finally, he's got the grandpa gray beard, right? I'm like, well, finally, he actually yeah. looks like, yeah. That he's yeah. not 30. Yeah. And he still right. laughs like he's 16 years of yeah. age. Yeah. Tell him I say hey, hi. I will yeah. for sure. Thanks, you Marie. Tell my best to Tony and the family. I will. And uh, again, Leanne Lang doing that thing she does, and we're grateful for it. And uh, boy, this was a lot of fun. Thanks. Yeah, it was awesome. Thanks, Dee. Damon Bye. Allen there all this week, and then Brad Shaw. Thank you for joining Kenner Brewer Potluck Leadership and Coaching segment via Facebook. Shout out to Chris Corvo producing the segment. Thanks, Chris, up in northern New York and upstate New York. Not Tonawanda, not Dick Eyed Pontiac and all that area. Okay. Watertown? Not even Watertown. He's shaking his head now. Okay. Either way, we're grateful for him and we're grateful for Langer. We'll talk to you real soon. Everybody have a great day. Stay safe and stay well.